I don't know, for those of you in the back didn't hear, I said when she finds out what I'm going to talk about, she should tell me. Um, <laughs> hey, thank you so very much for the opportunity to join you. This has been a great experience for me, and I have enjoyed and learned so much from you individually and from your breakout sessions and from other speakers and from Tony and his team, and I'm really glad that... Um, you know, all the value proposition right now is from you to me because I now have a much firmer grasp of the importance of the North Carolina New Schools Initiative. And I do know, let me echo you, that in this room are gathered many of the most important people who have the commitment, the energy, and the focus, plus the talent, to help ensure two very, very important goals for this state. Number one, that every North Carolinian has the information, education, and skills necessary to get and keep a good job. And number two, that every North Carolinian business can access the educated and skilled workforce necessary to compete in the 21st century global economy, and that means to keep and grow jobs right here in North Carolina. So I too want to extend my thanks for the commitment that we share and the courage you have shown to be risk takers and innovators and indeed to pursue this critically important vision. Um, I also went back and looked at your actual stated mission for uh, new schools. And it is, in case you've forgotten it, quote, <laughs> to accelerate systemic sustainable innovation in schools across the state. Now, of particular note, and I'm going to mention this later, that doesn't actually say STEM. Um, and I'm kind of glad it doesn't because I ab absolutely believe that the mission we all have to undertake, not just in North Carolina, but across this nation, is to commit to sustainable, systemic reform in our educational system. So. Well, as Dan and I agreed, although the uh, last spot on a long program is not necessarily my preferred placement, um, I actually think your conference designers probably got this right. So here's my first myth for the day that I want to test on you. Here it is. Wisdom flows from Washington. I don't think I have to ask for this show of hands. Would everyone believe, everyone who believes that's true, please raise their hands? Yeah, you got that one right. Okay. Although I've spent most of my career in Washington, the most productive venues of learning and doing are always in the states and in regional economies across this nation. I've had boots on the ground in North Carolina mm, for many, many times in the course of my career. Early in my tenure as Assistant Secretary of Labor, I was called to North Carolina when you experienced the closure of Pilatex and the very dramatic impact that had on thousands, yes, thousands of North Carolinians as you were, in fact, facing the loss of legacy industry jobs in textiles, furniture, and tobacco, almost all at the same time. I was asked to coordinate the potential of federal agencies and their resources to come in and help build the programs to reskill and reemploy the North Carolinians who had lost those legacy jobs. I returned not too many years later to launch uh, new programs of study beginning at Forsyth Technical Community College for the then incubating biotechnology industry. The Piedmont Triad was then one of our first, what we call wired regions, workforce innovation in regional economic development, where we were attempting to see, could we bring together the silos of economic development, education, and workforce development for the benefit of new jobs and new opportunities for workers across the economy. And more recently, in a very different capacity, working on behalf of the nation's manufacturers, I returned to work with your community college system as one of the first in the nation that was going to illustrate how acad strong academic foundational programs and applied 
learning of hard skills in manufacturing jobs could in fact be integrated into post-secondary programs of study for credit on a pathway to a good job in advanced manufacturing. So all of these opportunities to join you here in North Carolina are now informing one of my current assignments, which is in fact to provide some new counsel to your new governor on the structure, policy, and investment priorities that North Carolina should now pursue in education, workforce development, and economic development. So I hope that makes my presence here relevant to your conference. I always feel privileged to return to North Carolina with a passion to support innovation in all three of those areas. But when I show up for education conferences across the country, I know there's always someone in the room who's thinking, if not asking, why a workforce development expert in our education conference? And let me assure you, I'm not in the least bit offended by that because having worked in the administration, the past administration in Washington and around multiple administrations, I know that in this nation we have created a very false dichotomy between education and workforce development. We've even created siloed systems to prepare people for jobs while we had the best world-class education system on the globe. And I'm all about ending that false dichotomy. And from what I've seen at this conference thus far, you folks are there too. So I think together we have a lot of good work we can do. And let's agree, uh, I hope, that Americans and American workers are indeed among the best educated, skilled, flexible, and resourceful in the world. Our citizens do adapt much more quickly to changing processes and technologies than in many other countries. Critical initiative and um, critical thinking and initiative taking are hallmarks of both American education and American workplaces. It's not the underlying quality of our human capital, but the effectiveness of our human capital market and systems. And by that I mean their excessive costs, the low degree of completion rates, the mismatch with employer needs, the poor information for students and workers, and the misaligned incentives for employers and education and training institutions that holds back economic growth and job creation in this country. 23 million working age Americans are unemployed, underemployed, or discouraged from seeking work today. And workforce participation is lower than it has been for 30 years. Over six million young people, if this doesn't break your heart, it should. Six million young people ages 16 to 24 are neither in school nor at work unable to reach even the first rung of our opportunity ladder. For many Americans, especially those with limited education, skills, and professional uh, networks, pathways to meaningful work are absolutely fragile and unclear. Well, the United States just can simply no longer afford to treat education and job training as social services separate from our economic strategy. Even as states all across the nation implement K-12 education reforms, we need to channel public investments in secondary and post-secondary education and workforce development in ways that catalyze complementary private sector action, commitment, investment, and ultimately employment. So why is this? you know as well as I, the opportunity for meaningful work is essential to American economic dynamism and prosperity. Whether through employment or entrepreneurship, work is the way to not just earn a living, but provide for family, build human social capital, and create products and services that we all value. Given the rising skill requirements that you've heard a lot about during this conference of our modern workplace, 
and the accelerated pace of innovation and the creative destruction that's happening in the economy, our education system and the supposedly linked systems that we've created to continuously upgrade worker skills, match people with work that interests them and encourage employers to hire, well, they're all badly in need of transformation. Together, it seems to me, we are responsible for the paths to prosperity for all Americans. So, I believe an important part of your mission here today and when you leave here, back in your regional economies and on behalf of your state, it's about building the pipeline of new workers in America through our education system and providing more on and off ramps to education and the skills development necessary for transitioning workers as well. This is about the ability to get and advance in a career as an accountability measure for the education system. This is about ending that false dichotomy between education to produce an educated citizenry and some marginal workforce development system to produce employable young adults and working adults. This is about building an innovative education ecosystem that prepares citizens for good jobs and careers. We are in this together and we need to start thinking and doing together. So the focus of your work this week, scaling STEM, I gotta say, it's especially important in our work together, but I was a little concerned about it because there's a huge amount of attention and investment and policy discussion about STEM. But let me tell you, in many state capitals and in Washington, they don't define it as broadly as I heard you all define it at lunch today. It's still about science, technology, engineering, and math. That be it. And that's not right. So I was very pleased to hear your expanded definition. And I'm also glad to see that there were two particular findings in the most recent nationally recognized report about STEM education that I want to share with you because they really tie to what we need to do right here. The report finds that nationally, interestingly, we're producing enough traditionally defined STEM workers to fill all the STEM jobs in the economy, but that these students and workers divert from STEM careers. They find that their underlying STEM competencies are valued outside what you and I would define as STEM careers, and often those jobs are more lucrative. So this increasing demand for core STEM competencies across the entire economy thus becomes a big concern for our wealth producing industries like manufacturing and energy because their STEM educated graduates are choosing to work elsewhere. This means of course that not only do we have to get students through high school prepared to continue their education in STEM, but also we need to keep them excited about the opportunities in STEM careers as they gain the credentials necessary to get and advance in these fields. But this all also means, as you recognize, that the growing demand for STEM competencies outside traditional STEM occupations requires a much more broad-reaching strategy in our K through 16 education system. This means ensuring that we have a stronger and dynamic STEM curricula in all of our pathways to high school graduation and in the sub-baccalaureate and baccalaureate programs of study in our post-secondary institutions. And all of this must be tightly linked to the competencies necessary to get a job. So you and the community college city systems in North Carolina have to be working together now developing the innovative learning ecosystems that will be absolutely essential to preparing your students for a world of work that moves at the speed of light. So, now, what, what information can I bring to you today to tie these findings to new policy potentials and, and to 
supplement your knowledge about what's happening in Washington, D.C. Because like it or not, what happens in Washington, D.C. and in your state capital has huge implications for your opportunity for success. I spent last summer and fall engaged uh, by the DC-based Bipartisan Policy Center to begin the process of finding consensus on some of the toughest issues facing us as a nation related to the role of education at all levels in the nation's workforce development goals. Well, for those of you who don't know, the Bipartisan Policy Center has been around since 2007, and it was sent up by the former Senate Majority Leaders, Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, Bob Dole, and George Mitchell. A motley crew, there never was. Some of you are old enough to remember them, I hope. But their intention, they really are the only DC-based, truly bipartisan group of influential uh, officials from across the nation that can develop and promote solutions that can attract public support and quite frankly build political momentum even in these times of intense partisanship that we all suffer under. So for four months, I interviewed former and sitting governors, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, business executives, labor leaders, and a sampling of education and workforce leaders across the country. It was an extraordinary honor to do that. From these extensive discussions, a short list, very short, of consensus, very strongly held recommendations emerged, which in my mind is absolutely remarkable considering the complexity and the number of issues confronting us in education and workforce development reform. So I want to share those five priorities with you. First and foremost, National and state leadership is imperative. Education reform and producing an educated and skilled workforce must be among the highest priorities for the president of this nation and the governors of every state. Second, top-down solutions simply don't work. Aligning education, workforce development, and economic development will only happen in the states and regional economies, and we need to transform investment policy and systems to recognize that. Third, the current culture of pushing young people only toward four-year college degrees is creating unfortunate consequences. I want to stop there for a moment and say, I turned that one into very diplomatic language because what they really said um, would have been, um, well, it wouldn't have been well accepted. Um, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, we all know, and they know, that earnings increase, opportunities increase with a baccalaureate degree and a graduate degree from college in um, this economy. However, they, their belief is that our push and pull only to four-year degrees has had such incredible bad ramifications for so many students and so many families that we need to have the courage to say not everyone should or could pursue a four-year education. Um, and of course, they coupled with this that recognizing that 63% of the jobs in the economy between now and 2018 will require some post-secondary education, not necessarily a full four-year degree. We must do something about access and affordability for post-secondary education in this country, period. The fourth, everyone needs better information on jobs, occupations, and skills in demand and the labor market signals from economic drivers in the 21st century. We are a nation that should do better in reading labor market signals and in assuring that we are teaching and training to the skills in demand. And finally, fifth, the private sector businesses must take greater responsibility for identifying education and skill needs and must be better and stronger drivers of all related policies and investments. 
Now, you and I both know that these priorities are artic articulated at the very highest level, and there are a host of very complex, very difficult issues underneath each and every one. But I think they're important because they are signals of what we can and should be focusing on in terms of our transformation of systems. And that's why I've translated them into what I call five conversations that matter in DC. On any given day in DC and in state capitals across the country, I can guarantee you, there are thousands of conversations going on about this stuff. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, I think there are five that matter. And here they are. Um, and, and this is why they're different. Number one, they're driven by new players, not the players who are heavily invested in each of the systems and their status quo. Number two, they are all bipartisan and big goal oriented. They are bold. Number three, they're cross-sector with representatives of government at all levels, federal, state, regional, and local, business and industry, labor, academe at all levels, pre-K, yeah, pre-K through 12, through 16, through 20. All of that's important. Economists and politicians, social media leaders, critically important. Nonprofits and philanthropies, think tanks and advocates. Those are the folks that are at the table, and they all have an incredible sense of urgency. They believe the time is now, the momentum must be ma maintained, and change will come. And it's the first time in my way too long career that there has been a strong belief that change will come. So here are those conversations, and then I'm gonna translate them very quickly to what that means right here in North Carolina. The first is that bipartisan policy-centered dialogue I spoke about because influential bipartisan leadership to drive this to the top of the national and your state agenda, absolutely essential. We've never had it before. Second, something called a flexible federalism bipartisan dialogue that's been initiated by about eight governors from across the nation. But their basic premise is that communities and regional economies all across this nation are facing a brand new reality. And that reality includes budgets that are not improving and tax bases that are dwindling in many areas, leaving core public service, that includes education by the way, and infrastructure needs in crisis or on the brink. They also see that traditional economic development, infrastructure and investment programs tend to pit political jurisdictions against each other instead of encouraging an effort to bring those political jurisdictions and all the right players within them together in response to a regional economic reality. The third is that federal investments in all of our areas of interest are most often top-down, heavily prescribed, and um, inflexible, to say the least. All of these folks really understand that we're entering a new era where regions and states are asking to be held accountable for outcomes for what they deliver, even with declining dollars because they know that the key to unleashing our 21st century economy is not big money, it's big flexibility. The third important discussion or dialogue is what's called the Hope Street Group's Jobs and Workforce Initiative. And this is a group that, again, on a bipartisan basis is bringing practitioners together with policymakers to really create collaborative solutions for the most pressing issues facing the country, and they have identified education and workforce system reform together as a top priority. Fourth is Opportunity Nation, which in partnership with Civic Enterprises is a national movement of 250 youth development organizations touching 100 million people, united around a shared plan to rebuild the American dream. At last fall summit, they released and are now beginning work on a national plan of action for what they call enterprising pathways. And this ought to resonate with you because I actually think this is what you're doing here in North Carolina. But they are creative educational pathways from high school to and through community colleges and into and to completion in four-year universities that are well-executed, 
what you and I would know as career and technical education programs that can be powerful engines of 21st century opportunity. And the result is all about keeping students motivated and enrolled in secondary and post-secondary education, ensuring education and training are relevant to global markets, and reducing the costs of post-secondary education by increasing efficiency and shortening the time to completion. And fifth, the last one I'll mention is the National Business Roundtable. And I'm mentioning this because I struggled to get the National Business Roundtable, the most influential voice of business CEOs in America, to commit to kind of own a benchmarking of nationally portable industry recognized credentials to see if they should in fact be among the best tools for schools to use to better align educational learning systems to employment opportunities and success. So that's five conversations that matter. But moving from conversation and dialogue to action is absolutely paramount. And that is and will continue to happen only in states and regional economies across the nation. I happen to believe North Carolina can and should be a leader in this effort. Here's another myth. See, Lindsay said I had to have myths. How many of you believe that bad things happen in three or there really are only six degrees of separation? I like that one actually. Do, do you believe either one of those? Okay, I'm dispelling it. I'm busting that myth about the importance of three and six. Instead, the magic number is five because of these, this particular speech. I've told you about five important consensus positions among the most influential political leaders in this country. I've told you about five conversations that really matter in Washington, D.C. because they will result in both investment and policy change. And now I want to challenge you to consider five important actions that need to be taken right here in North Carolina. These are systemic transformations that I believe you should aggressively pursue. The first, and don't tell me you don't have anything to do with this because it is your voice that will make this happen. The first is we need to restructure your state organizations to align the policies, practices, and investments across education, workforce, and economic development. Your new governor is ready for good ideas in this regard. The second, you need to recognize the rise of regions and structure your local education innovations to link and leverage in support of that regional economy. Third, I challenge you to translate the learnings from your North Carolina New Schools Initiative to systemic reform. You know, across the nation, we know that innovations that create boutique schools will not result in the necessary outcomes for all students, positioning all of them for post-secondary education and careers in the 21st century economy. Now, I know your Pathways to Prosperity and your new I3 grant are headed in this direction to systemic transformation, I would just say, push harder and faster. Fourth, demand real business engagement and leadership. And to do this, I know there are great business representatives in this room. There aren't enough, and we need more. And to do this, you must ensure that business executives see a direct relationship between your output and their input, or they won't stay at your table very long. And finally, I would say, scale STEM. Use your influence and your investments to ensure students, parents, educators, and public policymakers understand that STEM competencies are really the basic skills across all sectors in our economy. And only by ensuring students and transitioning workers can gain these skills can you help restore middle class jobs to North Carolina. There's a role for everyone here. Business and industry must mobilize to become the leaders in all these reform efforts. 
government needs to become a facilitator, an investor, and set the broad accountability goals, and then get out of your way. Third, leaders in the education and workforce development systems need to tear down those old Berlin walls, stop protecting the status quo, and become the change agents, as those of you in this room have become. And finally, individuals all across this state need to understand that the pathway to the American dream is, is through gaining the education and skills necessary to get and advance in good jobs. The time is now, and this is our moment. Thanks for having me, and I want to, at this point, invite Dan to join me on stage. Thank you.